Hi everybody, Andy McPhee here, uh, along with uh, Doug Kenny, uh, the main host of Relentless and Unstoppable. As with each series we do, I let people know how this started. Relentless and Unstoppable started about a year and a half ago after my coaching and mentoring of Doug for six and a half years. Doug is an incredible human being who was um, he's dealing with high functioning autism and at school he was dealing with obesity and bullying and depression and medication and hospitalization all those things that tend to come along with when you're dealing with something in life and Doug over the last few years we've had an amazing journey he's gone from 300 pounds to down to close to under 200 now he does yoga running walking he's now into bodybuilding which we organized and, and helped him you know do it the correct way his diet is incredible and it's an inspiration of his story which is why I created this channel and since then I think Doug said to me the other day and he can confirm this we've had probably 181,000 views over the last year or so which is great for a couple of guys who have no idea what they're doing <laughs> at all like zero but we're getting better and I'm actually learning off Doug now because uh, he is he is very relentless uh, he never gives up so doug i'll hand it over to you to introduce our amazing guest and so scott was kind of like jesus right wow. so it's sort of like i kind of i think it keyed him into okay so when people come here they're, they're the stakes are very high you know yeah wow couldn't get any higher than that you know mm, yeah. yeah that's that's uh, that's incredible and you know, like, uh, I must get Dan on the show too. I'd like to get him back on again one day with you because he's he's dealing with those sort of people as well. Um, mm. And and so, and I think I know why uh, at the start, Doug called you Scott now. It makes sense. Oh, yeah. from the film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. I, that's why he called you Scott. Yeah, that's, that's um, the reason why I was I was fascinated when watching the documentary about what Scott was doing. So that's... Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I wish I was Scott. <laughs> <laughs> so look, and we'll get to Brendan in a minute. But so what, what trauma have the horses been through? So um, look, a lot of different things. So num number one, like... Those, uh, to get a thoroughbred X race horse going in the industry, those horses are taken from their mothers at a very young age, you know. So they, they um, if they're born to be race horses, they get taken from their mums at a young age, they get stuck in a stall, they get brought out once or twice a day to do their training and, and, and whatever, but they're very much isolated from other horses, you know, because they're often valuable. So they don't want them getting kicked or into fights and that sort of stuff, injured with other, around other horses. And horses are, um, they're social animals, you know. When, when you put them into a paddock or in the wild, they, they, uh, they live in herds. And there's a very, um, very uh, solid structure in the herd of um, how, like, the hierarchy of, of um, who's the boss and who's the leader and all that sort of stuff. So once they go into racing, they don't, they don't uh, get any of that horse education, that a normal horse would get. So they end up becoming, um, in, the, in the way that a horse would normally operate, um, they just don't understand a lot of those body language kind of signals. So when they're um, finished in their racing industry, they often don't know how to interact with other horses properly. So often if you're driving past the paddock and you see a thoroughbred standing on its own, it's, it's often because it hasn't interacted well with, uh, the other horses that it's in the paddock with. Um, wow. as, as, I mean, aside from that's a sort of, I guess, a social, so psychological kind of problem they get. There's also the fact that, you know, the, the, the job of the racing owners and the trainers and whatever is to make that horse run as fast as it possibly can. Mm. And they'll do anything to make that happen. You know, yeah. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes that the racing industry don't like to talk about or admit to, but they do to horses to get them to run incredibly fast. You know, mm. um, so they often come out of it, uh, often come out of the racing industry with psychological problems, but also like just physical uh, problems from from the stuff they've gone through. You know, being the kind of elite um, horses, I guess. Um, mm. 
And and then the reality is, like a lot of those horses, once they leave the uh, the racing industry, uh, they've only been trained for one thing, and that is to run super fast, you know, in a straight line. And to ride one of those horses, you have to be a very good rider. You know, they're typically only ridden by jockeys. So, so those horses, they're not suitable for a lot of people to ride. And therefore, the owners often go, well, what do we do with it now? Like, it's finished its racing career, probably didn't make us any money. It's only going to cost us money to, like, keep it in a paddock. Um, not many people can ride them. You know, an average rider getting on a thoroughbred racehorse can be in a very dangerous situation very quickly because they're mm. too powerful and they're too fast. So a huge amount of them end up being slaughtered, you know, um, and they get sent to, you know, the doggers for, for pet food. And, uh, um, uh-huh. you know, it's, uh, it's, that's, that's horses are the racing industry's collateral damage, you know. In the racing industry, they call it, um, what do they call it? Wastage. Wow. So the, ho- the horses that are killed um, after their racing career because no one knows what to do with them or the owners can't be, can't be bothered paying for them to live out the next 20 years of their life uh, in some sort of, like, peace. Um, they just say, oh, look, too bad for the horse, and, and they mark it down as wastage, you know. <coughs> Disgusting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, so, you know, Scott, for last 20-plus years, has been um, rehabilitating these horses. So what he does is he, he retrains them, so he gets them from the, the racing kind of mentality. He retrains them so that they can be... Uh, useful as equestrian horses or therapy horses or recreational horses. Um, what a genius. And that involves, yeah, and that involves a whole process that, that, that takes weeks and weeks, a lot of time, a lot of patience, uh, a lot of gentleness to sort of get them to calm down, get them to trust people, um, get, get their adrenaline under control, fix up their physical problems so that other people recognise then that, oh, this horse now has value we could do this with it or we could do that with it. And then they'll, you know, those horses might get another 20 years of life, you know. Oh, that's great. That's so good. Yeah. What a good story. You know, something you said, Nick, then um, is when you said the horse that stands by itself because it's not mixing with the others, that straight away went to that guy you were talking about, you know, where he didn't mix with the others. And that's yeah. why now I get why like with the the horses where they're from and these guys that's why they intermingle because the humans can get to see what these horses have been through and they're acting in the same way the only thing is they can't take their own life yeah you know and i'm not saying i don't mean that in a way that you know suicides are a a great it's it's terrible that's why we do these programs and talk on suicide so we can get people to see there's always hope and if you can get that with a, a an animal that's been traumatized like that and bring it back to life. You can do it with a human being, which that guy's already proved that he proved to himself that he just needed that and the horse um, and that theory to bring him out of that horrendous story about he's already dug his own grave like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's well, pretty that's powerful. Right. I mean, the interesting thing about the horses is um, a, the veterans know and, and, and quite quickly understand that there is real similarities between the kind of training regimentation and the institutionalization that that soldiers get in the military and that the horses get in the racing industry, you know, and and both those big institutions, if you want to call them that, um, the the racing industry and the military kind of machine, <clears throat> you know, they 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 can use up the veteran and they can use up the uh, the horse and then they can spit them out and leave them largely to their own devices, you know? And, wow. it, and, and that process can leave the horse and the, and the human very, very damaged, um, but without any support or help. And so Scott's idea of bringing them together, I think it, it straight away you could tell that the veterans understood the similarities. And, yeah. and very early on, Scott points them out in case they haven't clued into it, he points them out. So there's this empathy that the veterans have towards thoroughbred X race horses in particular, you know, yeah. where where they're sort of going, oh yeah, okay, you guys have been through sort of some similar stuff in some way. And if if we're able to give you a new career, because we've lost ours, um, then that'd be great. And yeah. in, in in sort of helping the horse, they help themselves. 
you know. That's really, that's fantastic. And I'm sure, you know, like, again, what you said, people watching this, you know, like um, some people will get it straight and some are like, wow, I never thought of that. And that's amazing because they both are the same. They've both been pushed to the extremes. That's why certain soldiers only make the elite because they get pushed to the absolute extreme. Like the horse is pushed to serve someone to make money. The soldiers are pushed so they can serve to get into places where they need to go to serve a country or whatever the cause is, yeah. whether it be whether we think it's right or wrong. The point yeah. is they're still doing it, you know, and yeah. that's that's amazing. Can we just ask Brendan, can you just tell us why you took up the horse therapy and what your um, experiences were working with the horses and how it's helped you? 